Hello my soccer universe, it is time for another top 10 and this time I'm shooting the top 10 moments ahead of the top 10 jerseys, let's see if I will post it that way, but probably I will do um, just for a simple reason, this is a, I need to do a little bit less <laughs> research for that one, but I did a lot of brainstorming uh, to get this. So what I'm going to present to you are what I think are the top 10 stories that affected me the most soccer wise this year that I got most excited about where I still get a little bit um, uh, you know joy or uh, it's of course kind of, kind of amazing the goosebumps and all those kind of things um, I know I put them in order from 10 to 1 but I think if I'm honest number one and three that's probably what I would say was the mo were the most exciting things this year for me but starting from 4 to 10 I had to find a trade-off between ranking them really and also having a little bit of a storyline in the video. So, you know, I would actually don't take this ranking all that serious, but you know, top 10 is a top 10. I again give you honorable mentions, other stories that I considered um, right after number 4. So, let's dig right in. And the first storyline that I really made me happy this year is the Italian Renaissance and I mostly mean the national team. How this young national team, admittedly in a group, a qualifying group that was not so strong, but they won every single game. They scored, they were young, they were exciting. Yes, they were lucky at times, but I have to say, uh, especially the game in Finland, I think the win was a little bit um, a gift from the referee, also against Bosnia. They really had to um, work hard, but I can say, this Italian national team, I'm quite excited. I'm so excited that although I didn't like it initially, I would like to have this green national team jersey that they have, because it is just a symbol of, yes, we are getting young, the future is ours, and they're playing exciting soccer. Um, I think it's a little bit too early for the Euros that we can really can say that they will be um, there in the semifinals, but I would not be surprised if that is happening. I just don't think it might not quite yet, because there are other teams that have a lot more experience and probably a bit more, uh, better... Um, you know, a bit more steady. Uh, but the amazing thing is that this squad is very broad. There are many players that can fit in there. And for that reason, I really liked what uh, Italy was doing uh, this season. And I'm looking forward, going forward. Um, and also, just as a backdrop, in 2017, Italy was down. In 2018, they were slowly building up through the Nations, through the Nations League. You could see that there's something growing, but it was not really yet convincing. And then this year, I think it made click for most of those players. And a big, big um, credit should go to Roberto Mancini, who really turned this around. Also, the Italian FA going for... A bigger name coach and not uh, going for a cheap coach again so really really happy with that one and in Italian Renaissance I also need to include the women's national team who at the World Cup women's World Cup was one of my favorites it was really refreshing to see how they beat Australia how well they played against Jamaica then uh, the energy they put in against Brazil yes they did they, they fell short but then um, they had this um, in the um, round of 16 against China, they were really good. I mean, yes, it is not. Uh, it was hot, and 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 that's so why in the end they they failed at a Dutch team that was just a little bit better. But I actually think that even the Italian women's national team has a bright future ahead of them. So Italy is on the rise again, and this is something that always makes me happy. Number nine is one of the few more negative ones that I have, and probably the yeah, if I look at it, more or less the yeah, more or less the only mostly negative one. But it's also it's Barcelona stumbling through the season. Yes, uh, they basically had the um, La Liga wrapped up uh, more or less by March or something like that. You always knew it's gonna be Barcelona, and everyone said the focus will be on the Champions League. And I have to say, for most of the time, it actually went quite well. I mean, they made it to the semis with relative ease. I mean, Manchester United was not really 
a big stomach block. Lyon was not that much. But, you know, you could see that they, when it counts, they really were showing signs that, yeah, we are now here. All we want to do is win the Champions League. We are the strongest team. Um, and then they ran into a Liverpool side where I remember my brother saying, it was before the semifinal, I said, this is a team, this type of team Barcelona has not played all season. This is a team that can hurt Barcelona. And still, the first uh, leg in Barcelona, it was a very interesting and exciting game. And it was uh, in, in interesting also in the sense that Barcelona was kind of holding a little bit back, but were clinically. They win it 3-0 with a, uh, and a free kick of Messi that is one of the best free kicks that I've ever seen. And you saw, yes, Barcelona is right there. We have a three-goal lead against Liverpool. We're going to put the demons from the year before to bed. Uh, Roma, we're going to make it in Anfield. And then you go to Anfield. You give up an early goal. Then you have a short period of where you could and where you should have made a goal. I think this is where the whole thing broke. And then you can see the second goal and then everything falls apart. You could see how timid they are, how Messi dependent, and Messi is still the best player, I also this year, but everyone's looking for Messi, no one's taking responsibility for themselves. And that was Barcelona's undoing in the Champions League, losing 4-0 away to Liverpool. Uh, I, it's Still beggars belief because, yes, the first win, that scoreline was not deserved. I think a 2-1 for Barcelona would have been much more uh, re representing the uh, strengths there. And even the return, like, uh, it was not the 4-0 because there was a period, especially in the first half of Barcelona, could have made the goal and could have put the tie, tie to bed. They didn't. But then with such... Defending, I mean, the fourth goal for Liverpool, a school team doesn't make those mistakes. And then it continues a little bit. Um, Copa del Rey final, you lose to Valencia in a very similar fashion where you just throw everything away and you cannot, you cannot get in the game. You're just caught on, on, on the counter by Valencia. Uh, at the beginning of the season, I think it was one of the worst stars that Barcelona even had to a season, that they are still in first place now. Speaks for their resilience and there is some quality quality squad. Griezmann not really fitting in yet. No one knows where he should go. Then the whole ne Neymar saga. I mean, there was more failures than successes. The style of play is so not Barcelona that you really have to say. Barcelona is losing its identity. They are still one of the strongest sides in Europe. And they show, I mean, through this very tough Champions League group, with some luck, admittedly, in Dortmund and also... Uh, Prague but they make it through they make it through there are some bright signs um, but it's clear that Valverde you know I'm not in favor of firing a coach early on but I think Valverde has run its course and I think we will see change at Barcelona very very very, very soon at the moment I would not see them as a favorite for the Champions League maybe this is a good thing for them moving on number eight Serie A running. This one is hurt, hurts me a lot, but I have to say, um, while there were not many title races in Europe um, in spring, uh, we'll get to one a little bit later. I have to say, being a Milan fan and seeing Milan always in the run for a Champions League spot, which was the big goal for the season, absolute, the biggest goal for the season, was that, and having actually, at first you thought there's only one spot available, but then Inter fell down again. It was always you and ah, Napoli on top, and Inter kept dropping down. At one point, Milan was in third spot. Then came the derby. It was a great derby that Inter won, um, despite being the outsider for once. Inter won deservedly, I have to say. Hurts a little bit to say it. But yeah, at that point, then Milan started to crack, and Milan actually had a great, 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 great spring. At that, up until that point, they were flying. How, how they were beating Atalanta. I mean, Atalanta at one point was out of it. Then they creep back in again. The two Roman teams, in and out, in and in, in and out. There were so many great uh, and, 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 and exciting games. And it was not necessary that teams were stumbling. They were actually beating each other and getting themselves in and out. And the fact that Milan, after the loss of Darwin, no, they lost to Torino, there was really a time when you could feel they're not playing well and it's not going, go going well. And then look at the draw. And see, they actually might have a chance. And actually, they did have a chance. And it all culminated in the last match day 
where uh, at one point Milan was third, Atalanta was down, Inter was losing to Empoli, Empoli played their hearts out against Inter. They needed a, I think they needed a point to make sure that they are not getting re relegated. They played their hearts out and Inter somehow, somehow stumbled uh, to a victory there. A victory that eventually took Milan down, who at Spal, yeah, it was a little bit uh, exciting and they ran away as winners there, but it was really a crazy, crazy last day of Serie A season. One that made me very optimistic, even though they failed. Very optimistic for a new season and then it goes all the way down. But this last day of Serie A, I think it was the most exciting last match day. And not for the, for the championship, but for this uh, Champions League spots. That It was really, really, really exciting to watch. Number seven, ah, the Africa Cup of Nations. I told you, the Africa Cup of Nations is probably one of my favorite tournaments outside of the World Cup and the Euros, although the soccer is not great, but I just love watching um, African teams. And this year, there was hardly any great soccer. There were some wonderful, wonderful jerseys. If you saw my top 10, you saw already my favorite jersey from this year's AFCON. There were other great jerseys in there. Uh, and uh, probably there will be some AFCON jerseys showing in my top 10 jerseys of 2019. But for me, the real story was Madagascar to a lesser degree, Benin uh, and South Africa. The Minos actually making a run uh, for it. There was really... Uh, period in this tournament where I really thought, wow, what is Madagascar doing? Madagascar never has qualified before and suddenly they find themselves in the quarters where they're then overwhelmed by Tunisia, which is another slight outside. I mean, Tunisia has some weight in Africa and they were at the World Cup, but I still don't see them as an African power like I see other teams. South Africa beating Egypt? Wow. Uh, Morocco falling to Benin? Wow. There was really stuff happening there, um, but the only really sustained run, I have to say, was Madagascar, and that was really, really uh, exciting to see. That kept me on the toes. Uh, and, you know, it's if a minnow gets out in the quarters, that's not a bad spot, because they keep you interested, invested in the tour tournament, and then you see the semis and the, and the final. You're going to watch almost anyway. So, yeah. Minus at the FCOM, especially Madagascar, and I know I could have gotten a Madagascar shirt. Meanwhile, if these were available before uh, the FCOM, I probably would have got one. Now it's a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, FCOM, Minos. We gotta mention some Africa because it's always a good thing to talk about African soccer. Uh, let's go back to Europe with number six, and it's a similar uh, thread as we had for the Italian Renaissance. It's the Dutch Rising. Uh, that is another storyline that made me personally very happy. You know, my two favorite national teams, taking away family, uh, is Italy and the Netherlands. And I cannot tell you which one I like more. Maybe the Italians, I have a slight tendency towards the Italians, but then some, some, some the Dutch are so much more and more exciting. So, yeah. I see them as even footing, if I have to give you a favor, a slight, slight favorite, maybe Italy a bit more than uh, the Dutch, but honestly, I love my Dutch. I love, uh, if they play well, this always makes me happy. And they played well this year. Um, especially the two games in Germany. The first one, they lost at home, and I think that was one of the good German performances, but you could see uh, in the Nations League already, uh, the Dutch are a force to be reckoned with. And what I like about the Dutch is um, solid defense and a pretty decent midfield, where they're really weak is on the front, where if there's Memphis Depay not playing and he's out for the Euros, it's a little bit... <laughs> but I like also the young core that comes from Ajax, more on that a little bit later, um, that helps out a lot with the Dutch uh, becoming a power. And then if you have a Virgil van Dijk uh, being the leader that he is, you're bound to have a good team. I th I have to say the Dutch defense, uh, van Dijk, um, and uh, what's the young, uh, Matthijs de Licht, those two in the, in the back, I think this, this is a defensive pairing that many, many are envious uh, for. Um, the way that the Dutch took apart the Germans in Hamburg in the second game, I think it was September, was just amazing to watch. The way that the Dutch um, 
took also care of the English, where I thought that the England at the Nations League um, have probably the better chances, was also impressive to me. That they then fell apart against the Portugal side, I almost expected, because Portugal at home, um, and you know, the poor Portugal is kind of the kryptonite for the Dutch. So I expected them not being that great, and you, you could see that uh, the, the offensive frailties were showing. But the Dutch could be one of those teams that could go far at the Euros. I think I would say the Dutch are a step further because they have a little bit more hardened veterans than the Italians. I might be completely wrong and now with Memphis Depay out it might be a whole do a di different story but I have to say I really like my Dutch. And that leads us straight to number five. I think one big story of this year was Ajax. What Ajax did in the Champions League was nothing but awe-inspiring. And this was an Ajax team that, yes, in the Champions League already in fall 2018 played quite well. I mean, they survived the group with uh, Benfica and Bayern. I think even finished level on points with Bayern, but just in second place. And then they get drawn against the three times defending champions, Real Madrid. And completely dominate them in the first half and managed to lose the home game. And then they go to Madrid and win 4-1 with a goal by Tadic for the ages, with a free kick by uh, Schöne for the ages, you were just in awe of what they were doing. They were playing in a way that just filled your heart. Um, in the league, they actually lost early on, uh, had a pretty bad loss to Feyenoord. They already lost very badly uh, at PSV um, in 2018, so you kind of thought that it's PSV who will... Uh, runaway winners, but they crept, kept creeping closer and closer to PSV, and then there was the big matchup against PSV, where they got an admittedly lucky win. Uh, I think they had a man, they were reduced to a man, but they, they got a penalty, and they were level on points, and that was a lead they would never relinquish. They were level on points, and I think uh, due to a superior goal, the, the, the difference, they were in first place. And once they took it off, but they never relinquished it, although there were dangers that it might be, but it was actually PSV who was falling down. In the Champions League, they draw, were drawn against Juventus. A Juventus that uh, Ronaldo lifted over Atletico Madrid. A Juventus that seemed hell-bent on winning this Champions League. And a Juventus that showed how clinical they were in the first match in Amsterdam again. And... That was one of those games that was really, really exciting to watch. You had the very, uh, I want to say cold-blooded defending, very uh, of Juventus that said, you guys, Ajax, you can play whatever you like, but only up until here. Clinically, Ronaldo gives them uh, a lead. Ajax can equalize, uh, but cannot really produce many, many chances because Juventus keeps them at bay. And then they travel to Turin, and Ajax is all over Juve. I think in the first half, uh, Ronaldo gives them a lead. There was a quick equalizer, because De Giglio didn't uh, watch his line, that gave Ajax life. And in the second half, Ajax completely destroyed Juventus. Uh, in a way that you wouldn't have, have expected. For three halves, it was the story. Ajax, yes, young upstart team, plays attractive soccer, but just will fall short at uh, such hardened veterans that are playing with Juventus. And it was always in the balance, in a way. And then this uh, second half in Turin, where Ajax should have scored three or four, they could have dismantled Juventus as well. And they go on to the semis, where they suddenly were favorites. And in a twist that I didn't want to overemphasize, but they played against Spurs, uh, where they had first the away game and then the home game. And in Amsterdam, Ajax had always a little bit problem. They completely dominated a depleted Spurs team. I think they didn't have Son, they didn't have uh, a Harry Kane. They get an early goal, the goal they just missed to make a second and a third. Uh, Spurs only had a for short way they could hold Ajax at bay, but I think Ajax completely dominated the first leg. And that's always a bad thing for a Dutch team. If the Dutch feel too sure of themselves, then this is where things start fall, falling apart. But you could see that the first half in Amsterdam, 2-0 up, they are playing, they are scoring goals. It seems all, yes, we're going to, to, to the final. At that point, as we said, Barcelona stumbling. 
it looked all like a Johan Cruyff final Ajax against Barcelona, which would have been a nice final. I also said, no, uh, at that point it was Liverpool against Ajax. Um, the, the, the first leg was a Cruyff final. Liverpool against Ajax would also be a nice final. I was just afraid that one team would, would wear a weird jersey. But I think Liverpool Ajax would have been an amazing final. And then they get nervous. Lucas Moura quickly gets two goals and they get nervous, nervous, nervous. Then uh, the game is on the edge. Ajax hits at least once the po uh, post, has chances to cash Spurs on the counter. And then in the cruelest way possible, it all falls apart with Lucas Moura scoring a late stoppage time winner. The way the Ajax players fell on the floor, I mean, this was moment the most empty I felt during the entire year. Uh, it was just deflating to the highest degree, but it was a great run. Now, the group stage, for I they consoled themselves with winning the championship, and then I was fearing the great sell of Yes, Lasse Schoen is gone, the Licht is gone, Frankie de Jong is gone, so it's not that great of an Ajax team, but they even lit up the Champions League, and again, at home, could not get it done uh, unless they against a Valencia team that they completely dominated in Valencia a few months earlier, but they had just a week of horror where they just could not get it going. So yeah, it was a little bit in a smaller version, the same arc, where you remember this crazy game at Stamford Bridge where they have 4-1 up and then get two red cards and so on. It was, uh, the Ajax was one of the teams to watch this year. But yeah, with Ajax falling at this last hurdle in the last minute, this leads us to the next number four, the English dominance in Europe. We had two European finals, both played by um, Premier League teams. And some might say Manchester City was supposed to be the team in there, but Spurs got rid of Manchester City in another really crazy, crazy, crazy game. Um... It has to be said, the Champions League again in the quarterfinals and semifinals dished up so much drama that only the Champions League and great soccer that only the Champions League can. Champions League remains the best competition in the world. Um, that the final then fell flat is probably due to that the English season ended more or less right after the semifinals, which is still something that I don't get. The Europa League also, we had Arsenal, although I always thought Arsenal will fall at some hurdle relatively soon. Arsenal never fell. I thought they would go out against Rennes. No. Uh, I knew that Chelsea will be a team to watch, and they almost fell against Frankfurt in the, in the semis, where they were by far the better team. They never should have gotten down to penalties. And Chelsea took a while, but then Eden Hazard really showed... The great player that he is and made uh, gave Chelsea the Europa League and the nice picture with Sarri winning his first trophy and watching it like that. It was really cute. Also then uh, Liverpool, I think, were becoming the best team in Europe at that point. They lost only one game in spring. Uh, nah, they won, lost in the league one game. In spring, they, uh, of course, lost others, but uh, they were a juggernaut and could console. They lost out on the Premier League, as we will talk soon, but at least they got the Champions League. And I think this was a uh, just thing to have them win the Champions League. Okay, honorable mentions. I'm going to start out with Qatar at the Asian Cup. Yes, there was an Asian Cup very early on uh, in 2019 that Qatar won, kind of surprisingly. Uh, South Korea probably was the best team at that Asian Cup, but Qatar could hold them off. Uh, Japan threatened to win it again. Nope, did not happen. Same thing with um, uh, Australia, who kind of, the defending champions were also kind of a little bit floundering. But in the end, it's Qatar, and maybe this is the title that we need to justify to have a World Cup there. They are definitely building something. Um, I remember Ali Al Moes, who played a few games for Lusk a few years, years ago, being the top scorer there. Um, another one uh, that was more or less for the entire year, Ronaldo. Last year I mentioned Messi, this year I have to at least mention Ronaldo, because when it counted, Juve could count, count on him in the Champions League. He scored all their goals in the Champions League, now on Naga stage, especially against Atletico Madrid, he was outstanding. Of course, he not uh, he had a little bit of a tough uh, fall now, but then again, the last three, four weeks, he was again 
Uh, scoring, scoring, scoring. And I like what, what, what he's doing. He knows he's old. He cannot play full. He's taking care of his body um, and shows up when he needs to. That is something that uh, we should always um, at least admire in him. His personality and all the troubles that he went through might be a different story, but at least on an athletic level, I mean, the way he was hanging in the air and Genoa was just amazing. We had the UEFA Nations League Final Four. I think it was an interesting tour tournament. It lacked a little bit the overall punch. Um, it came at a time where there were other two tournaments running at the same time. So, yeah. But um, the scene I will always remember is that Ronaldo was a little bit upset that he did not win the best play of the tournament, although he scored the most goals and let uh, uh, the UEFA the president know at the reward ceremony when he collected the trophy. That was a little bit weird. Then we also had a very weird Copa America. Um, yeah, in Brazil, where we had a final. Peru played great. Except for one game, they lost to Brazil 5-0, and then they find themselves in the final again. Um, it was a Copa America that was marred by Messi kind of getting at the Federation. I mean, Argentina played really badly. Then they play against Brazil. They play a decent game, but of course they feel uh, hard done by uh, by that, you know, every, every, everything is for, for, for Brazil. It was not that nice, and then he gets sent off in a ridiculous fashion, kind of as, yeah, da-da-da. Uh, but the Copa America was a really weird tournament because I, I think the two best teams were Uruguay and Colombia in that tournament and they didn't even make it. They were all limited by penalties. And again, penalties right after 90 minutes. Uh, yeah, it was a weird tour to tournament, but, 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 but it was remarkable. But I was not so excited about that one as I was, let's say, for the Africa Cup of Nations or my number three, the Women's World Cup. It took me a while to get into it, but once I got into it, I have to say the Women's World Cup was really fun watching. Um, the only thing that made it not, that doesn't make it uh, go higher is that it was pretty clear from the get-go who will win it. And that was the United States who toyed with the opposition, you almost want to say. And that was a little bit the uh, downside of the entire Women's World Cup. But other than that, I have to have, 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 have to say it was a super enjoyable tournament. I talked about the Dutch, uh, about the Italians before. The Dutch women, uh, yes, the upper bracket with England, France, the US, and Spain was definitely harder than the lower one. But the Dutch made it to, to, to the final. The European champions made it through. Um, sometimes lucky, sometimes deserved. I was fully behind them. Uh, was very cool to see and uh, having the Netherlands play Italy in a quarterfinal, I couldn't believe that. Sweden completely uh, made my tournament when they knocked out Germany, because Germany looked to be a team that might threaten to make it to the final. No, they didn't. It was Sweden against the Netherlands, which was kind of a da-da-da-da uh, semi-final. The big matchups were, of course, France against the US, and you know, the US had probably the biggest scare I have have to have to say against Spain in the round round of the round sixteen. Spain really held held them. They needed two pen penalties uh, from the U.S. Uh, the U.S. always kind of in their way of being the big favorites. They didn't really endear themselves, but on the other side, they didn't need to. They were there. That Spain. They really played a great World World Cup. The match against France was probably the most hyped women's match of all time. Uh, ticket prices soaring. They could have played in the start of France for that one and sold, sold, sold it out three times over. Unfortunately, uh, the game didn't quite live up because it was, you know, I think at the first half it was 2-0 the US. The French could never find back. That was the one thing. The French got a tough draw and never got this real support. I mean, they almost got eliminated by Brazil and Brazil was kind of a so-and-so uh, team at this World World Cup. Uh, another big scare was against England. I think England had the US right there for the taking. Uh, but again, the US are just that much more talented, that much more experienced. So in the end, it was not that hard to um, get past England. I think it was deserved. I think England probably was the second best team at this at this World Cup. They finished only, I think, in fourth place because the third place game was not there. Um, the final was a little bit of a letdown because uh, the Dutch were happy to be there 
and um, uh, U.S. girls. You know, they were the ones who held the uh, U.S. girls for the longest until they gave up the score. But then they lose by 2 nil. So there you go. But overall, very enjoyable tournament. We should see more women's soccer. Um, I know I'm a little bit guilty myself, but it's a really it was a really great tournament. I'm looking looking forward to the European Championships um, in two years' time. Number two, I cannot believe I'm saying this, but the Premier League run in kept me on my toes. I have to say, you know, I'm a Serie A guy, and then I would say La Liga. But this year, the Premier League, especially in spring, you could not stop watching. I watched Liverpool almost every time. I watched Manchester City almost every time because you couldn't take their eyes off. They're winning, 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 winning. You had like, uh, they had eight or nine games left, both both of them. And you could not say, we, we all said, one is going to crack. It always seemed a little bit more likely though that Liverpool was cracking because suddenly Manchester City got rolling. Manchester City cracked in the Champions League. Liverpool didn't really crack in the league. They had just this short period of weakness where they had a big lead and then uh, end of January, beginning of February, they just started drawing a lot of games. And that is where they lost the league. Come March, then there was the international break. From then on, Liverpool was perfect again. But I remember a home game against Leicester where uh, they had the early lead. It was snowing. And then Harry Maguire gets the equalizer and Liverpool cannot get themselves back in, into the game. This, I think, is uh, one of those games that broke them. There was the fabulous 4th of January matchup between City and Liverpool, which probably was from the sheer quality the best game of the year and it all occurred early uh where you could in many ways see that liverpool is not quite ready yet because just a few little things in that game went city's way i remember a ball cleared off the line all these kind of little things where uh it could have gone liverpool's way if they get a draw out of there they win the championship uh, they had a bad showing at West Ham, but then on the other side, they got a very lucky win late, late in the season at Newcastle. I remember probably for City fans, the moment of the season was the, uh, again a game, I think it was again against Leicester, where a draw would have handed Liverpool more or less the title, because they had a, a last game at home. Uh, and this was kind of the one big chance where you say, there, Liverpool can win it. And then Quinz and company steps up and scores a worldie uh, from a far distance. The captain took over with a long range shot. The one thing that Guardiola hates the most, that seals the championship for them. Uh, yes, they were down on the last day, but immediately got back. And yeah, so City wins the championship uh, for a second time in a row this year. Liverpool has a much more comfortable lead now, so let's see how it will end this time. But this run-in was one for the ages. What can top this? Well, you probably won't be wondering. Lusk jersey. Yeah. That's what tops it for me. What Lusk did this year is the best what I've seen of Lusk in my lifetime. No other team has made me so happy. Yeah, I want to say it that way. Um, Yes, there were the Milan teams that really made me happy, but I have to say, if your hometown team is that always has been more on breakdown than, you know, always kind of relegation, as long as I'm fan, it was always first division, second division, first division, second, second division, getting even going. We had um, six years ago, we played in the third division. We were relegated because we didn't get the playing license because there were financial troubles all over the place. December 24th, 2013, the current ownership took over. It has been uphill from there. And they clearly established themselves as the second best team in Austria with a budget only half as big as the, v the big teams from Vienna. By budget, we should be on the number five or number six. We are comfortably the second best team in Austria because of really smart management, really smart transfer moves, building a squad, where every time you look at a player, you might not be that excited, but it's usually, they have all the talents there, it all fits, it always, whatever, every transfer is a hit. Then we lose our coach, we, you know, we had a, we had, had, had a period where we were only one point behind Salzburg in the Champions League playoff, uh, championship playoff, 
and then we had the home game and there we hit a kind of a skitty face we lost the cup semi-final i was there with my wife against uh, rapid where we completely dominated we just lost on penalties one of those then we, you know the results were not going our way ne 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 necessarily but it was safe to get the second spot we could not yet challenge salzburg however the coach was hailed as a genius he was four years here uh, and he oversaw everything, the rise in the first division, and then really uh, establishing this um, kind of nasty pressing style that we are known for. I was nervous for a new coach, Valerian Ismail. And again, boom! Not only did he not change much, he just, as he said when he took over the job, we just adjust a little bit. And the last place, uh, fall for the ages in the league we didn't have to exert we could rotate we um were the only team that really could uh, get to salzburg um in a way that uh they were challenged we were two one two nil up at the half we probably could have made it three one uh in the end yeah the energies was just not there because we played europa league we beat basel in the champions league playoff uh completely un uh, unexpected to me uh i thought basel is a much better team we play against brugge in the champions league playoff champions league playoff uh, that's why I'm, we have the champions league ball the champions league anthem was played in linz six years ago my whole lifetime i never dreamed of anything like like that there was only one year 98 where i thought maybe maybe we can scratch on the championship maybe we're playing in the champions league playoff yes we probably deservedly lost against uh, Bruges. It was watch the videos um, that I made on, on 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 that. I think over Bruges was better, but um, the game in Linz still leaves a sour taste in my mouth to the effect that when I see Bruges, it still stings a little bit. But Europa League, hey, here we come. We get a group where I say, oh, this is not that. Sporting Lisbon, PSV. Rosenborg, maybe we can beat Ros Rosenborg, but I was not, not so quite sure because Rosenborg also played not that badly in the Champions League playoff against Dinamo Zagreb. We beat Rosenborg 1 0. Then we go to Lisbon and play probably the best game of the season. Completely dominate Sporting Lisbon in pink jerseys, nonetheless. Managed to lose this. Five minutes. Five minutes. We had chances to make six goals. Five minutes. We are not attentive enough and they make us two goals. And we cannot find back, we cannot even find an e e equalizer. That was gutted. This was, I was really gut gutted at because I thought, oh, PSV is flying. Little did I know that Marlen got injured. First game in Eindhoven. Uh, so even the draw for that was hard. Ah, PSV is so dominant in the first few minutes. We cannot, Bergwijn, we cannot get a hold on but we hang in there this was kind of one of these on on the edge where psv has many chances hit hit uh, bars and so on but then i said lask also being dangerous we could have won that one but i think the nil nil it was a lucky point bergwan injures himself in that game and that opens us to the performance of the year for lask a 4-1 win over eindhoven that people still are talking about that at that point our coach became a legend and as i said he just did a few smart things advancing from the group becomes a possibility yes kind of a messy win in trondheim but you gotta get these as well a little bit of snow and uh then also you win against sporting lisbon because they don't send the first team and you win a group that i never thought they would we are playing now against alkmaar in the next round in the league we are so close to Salzburg. Yes, we could have twice taken first place in the league. Yes, the last two home games didn't go our way. Uh, I really put it down that we played a lot of games, but this team wants to play a lot of games. They don't use it as, a, as, a, as, as an excuse that Rapid, for instance, can prepare a whole week where we have to uh, play in Trondheim, where we got late. No excuse given. It is such an enjoyable team that I'm even thinking even if we lose now a player or two in that transfer break I'm not worried I'm not really worried about it they're absolutely an amazing team 
And I think there might be a challenge for Salzburg. I am not sure how the Europa League will go. I think Alkma might be like on the level with Bruges. Things go right. Yes, we were lucky in the group stage. Maybe we can advance to, to, to the next round. Um, but Lusk is becoming a great, great team. And I don't speak those things lightly. So for me, last year it was only number two. This year, it's a clear no, no, number one. And in addition, we're gonna, we finally can build our own stadium, which will also be very important for us. Uh, the future looks bright. And for most of the time that I've been a Lusk fan, the future looked very, very dark. So that to me, that's the thing of the year. Yes. You could see when they have a lot of games to play, they might not pull out the best performances, but they usually get their wins. And everyone in Austria says Lusk is one of the best teams. And I think we're getting close to challenge Salzburg. Salzburg has just way more money, and but we have smart management, so I'm very curious to see. There you go. Very long video. These were my top 10 moments of the year. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like this. And I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hey there. I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you might enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel as it will give you all the updates, all things that rotate in my soccer universe. And with that, I'm going to wish you a very good day. Bye.